Welcome to the award-winning Dare to Dream podcast with Debbie Dashner, covering metaphysics, ETs, shamanism, and channeling. Here you will find spiritual inspiration from today's thought leaders, along with cutting-edge insights from our interstellar brothers and sisters and ancient shamanic wisdom. Now, here's a new episode of Dare to Dream with your host, Debbie Dashinger. This is Debbie Dashinger inviting you to join me and some amazing presenters aboard the Galactic Origin Celebrity Cruise to the Yucatan in December. Go to D-E-B-B-I, D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R dot com slash cruise. Hi, this is Debbie Dashinger and welcome to Dare to Dream. It is so great to be here with all of you today. I did a little promo earlier and if you felt my infectious enthusiasm, it is real because I've actually never, I know this sounds very interesting on this show, but I've never had an NDE, a near death experiencer conversation. I've had folks on my show who have had NDEs, but for whatever very deeply spiritual, metaphysical, extraterrestrial, whatever reason, there were other things to share. I've never gone that deep, but I found this story extraordinary. So you want to hang on to who's coming up next. Dr. Eben Alexander is here. He is a near-death experiencer, and we're going to be talking about many things about his experience and post experience, and also how science supports your eternal soul. Another book of his as well, and there's even a third prolific author. And this show, Dare to Dream podcast, won three talk radio positive change awards, won the COVR award for best radio and podcast show, Welp Magazine named Dare to Dream, one of the top 20 best podcasts to listen to this year. It's high ranking also on Apple Podcasts. This show is sponsored by Dr. Dane here. They do beautiful energy work out into the world. If you'd like to become a facilitator or take one of their classes, go to Dr. Dane here, H-E-E-R dot com. And if you'd like to know what your galactic ancestry is, you can unlock your cosmic potential with a free starseed video and report, and you can explore over 19 different types of galactic starseeds. It's a captivating video with Debbie Solaris and myself. You can uncover your galactic origins and also the detailed report. Don't miss the chance to connect with your star lineage. Go to debbie-inger.com slash starseed. It is my free gift and thank you to you for being here. It's D E B B I D A C H I N G E R dot com slash starseed. My guest, Dr. Eben Alexander, was an academic neurosurgeon for over 25 years, including 15 years at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, Children's Hospital, and Harvard Medical School in Boston. In 2008, he experienced a transcendental near-death experience during a week-long coma from an inexplicable brain infection that completely transformed his worldview. A pioneering scientist and modern thought leader in the emerging science that acknowledges the primary of consciousness in the universe, he's the author of the New York Times number one bestseller, Proof of Heaven, as well as Living in a Mindful Universe, and his third book, The Map of Heaven. And if you'd like to learn more about him, you can go to ebenalexander.com. And with that, I welcome the amazing Dr. Alexander to the show. Great to have you today. Well, Debbie, thanks so much for having me on. It's great to be with you today. And I say your name correctly. Is that right? Well, Eben is probably the best, but uh, I'll answer to many things. But Eben Alexander, that's how I usually pronounce it. Eben like Evan. Right. And it it originally came from Ebenezer six generations ago. They dropped the Ezer. Thank goodness. So it's now just Eben. But that's an easy way to remember the pronunciation. It is. And I love the etymology of names. That's fascinating. So Eben, it is. Awesome. I want for people who have not yet read your books like I have, can you explain to them 
what bacterial meningitis is as a disease? Just an overview so they can understand. Well, first and foremost, it's a perfect model for human death because it's a very selective way of attacking the human part of the brain. Uh, meningitis, by definition, uh, covers the outer surface of the brain. It's named for the meninges, which are the membranes that contain the brain. Uh, but in my case, as in many such cases, it went much further than just that and uh, was a direct encephalitis. So my brain was under direct attack. In fact, the MRI scan showed that uh, there was no lobe of my brain that was unaffected, and I had full thickness damage occurring uh, during this illness. This is one of the reasons why the scientific community takes the story so seriously, is because I should not have had any kind of dream or hallucination, because those parts of my brain were off. Uh, and yet I have this profound, memorable, detailed experience that is the subject of that book and of thousands of talks I've given online about this uh, experience. Uh, and this is all really about the scientific response to that and where the scientific world is headed uh, about proving the reality uh, of basically eternity of soul. Mm, that's beautiful. So there's no reason why you should have gotten this disease. You're perfectly fine one minute, then you get symptomatic and unclear what's happening. You're in a hospital and it becomes so dire, you end up going in a coma. I know the doctors are calling all over the country. Your poor wife is trying to get a different kind of help, if you will, for you. And it's getting worse and worse and worse and worse. And then inexplicably, uh, you come back out. Now, since you've been around this decade plus, since that experience, have you had your brain scanned again? And if so, what have they found on this side of things? Has it fully well, mended? I think the, the I did have uh, uh, MRI scans, you know, when I was especially ill. Uh, I've not had a follow-up scan with my brain returning to normal. That's not something we, we normally do in medicine. I would love to do it. I would love to, I'd need to fund a scan like that uh, to get an MRI done. But uh, uh, the interesting thing really is in looking at my function, at my neurologic function, and especially it's important to realize there was a medical case report on my medical record. So it's not just what I report in the book, Proof of Heaven, including an appendix with a lot of the medical details, uh, but also a medical case report written by three doctors not involved in my care, but absolutely fascinated by this apparently miraculous recovery. And their case report appeared in the Journal of Nervous and Mental Diseases in September of 2018. And it was Dr. Serby Khanna, uh, Lauren Moore, and Bruce Grayson. And they made it very clear that my brain was in no shape to harbor a dream or hallucination or any of, any of the incredible, uh, fantastic uh, experience that I had. Uh, and the other interesting thing about the case report is when they were challenged by the peer review scientific editors of the Journal of Nervous and Mental Disease to say, hey, how do you explain this? It's unprecedented in the medical literature. Someone this ill from an E. coli bacterial men meningoencephalitis in coma for a week to then end up having a full recovery, especially with the medical parameters, the Glasgow Coma Scale, uh, that I had of, of five or six or seven, anything below nine is deep coma, a corpse gets a three. So six or seven and, and going as low as five is uh, incredibly deep uh, coma with a lot of brain damage uh, to get me there. And yet I ended up waking up and then coming back to this world fully over about two months. Now it is important to point out to people that when I quote woke up uh, you know, after a week in coma, uh, my brain was still so absolutely smashed by this experience that I didn't even recognize my mother, my sisters, my sons standing at the bedside. I had no idea who they were. All I knew was this extraordinary journey that I'd just been on. And, um, you know, the 15 years since that time has been spent working with family and others, with my doctors, the medical records to make better sense of my case. Uh, but ultimately, uh, to the explanation of those three doctors for how this miracle occurred is because he had a near-death experience. And that's the important scientific lesson for everybody out there, is that there's tremendous potential we have for healing. 
as we come to acknowledge more fully, you know, who we are, rising well above the little ego mind, uh, the little human voice, thinking it's uh, one incarnation, birth to death, nothing more, but acknowledging that we're truly eternal souls, uh, that we've been here before, we'll be here again. Uh, and this is about something much bigger than just the little ego mind, which can fool us into believing that none of this is real. Yeah. But this is where the science is so important because the science is illuminating the reality, not only of, uh, of the afterlife, but even of reincarnation, uh, which is pretty much proven beyond a reasonable doubt, given the scientific investigation. In particular, if people want an example, go to the University of Virginia Division of Perceptual Studies website, that's uvadops.org, and you'll find a tremendous literature on all of this, including more than 2,500 cases of past life memories in children they've investigated over six decades, of which 1,700 are solved. That is, they actually found the person who lived before. So uh, a lot of this is not necessarily admitted or understood by modern science, but the scientists who study consciousness are way ahead of the curve on all this and do not doubt its reality. In fact, for your listeners to really go to a great information source, go to uh, bigelowinstitute.org, where you'll find 29 essays written three years ago by some of these uh, most capable scientists, proving the reality not only of the afterlife, but of reincarnation. Yes, I, I'm aware of some of these children being born with these Hmm, memories. And also, you know, there's people like Matthias de Stefano, who remembers his other galactic lives as though they are present. And, mm -hmm. and that's, I think, an enormity for one person to carry around an understanding of every soul experience one has had. So this is happening more and more. I think there's great reason on the planet right now why it's happening. And when you tell the audience about this very grave situation that you were in, can you give them, pull back the curtain a little bit for those who have not had the grace yet of reading your book, what happened when you were in this state? You know, and if I were to be honest with you, the beginning sounded kind of a little scary when you were describing the earthworm view. Um, and I don't know how you felt. It sounded like you were very much in the flow of whatever was happening. However, I'd love to hear in your words, your, and I know it'll be a very condensed experience, but give us a picture of what was going on when people were presuming you were dying and certainly in a coma. Well, it's important to point out that at that time I was 54 years old, had honed a very conventional scientific worldview. I taught neurosurgery as an associate professor at Harvard Medical School for uh, 15 years. Thought I understood something about brain-mind consciousness. Uh, but then was driven deep into coma. Uh, and uh, your intro story was almost correct. The important thing to point out is I went to coma at home in bed and never had any awareness of the ambulance ride at the hospital at the time of the ER or the seven days in the ICU. I was gone from this world before I ever left, left home, essentially. Um, but a crucial thing to point out is there was an unusual feature by NDE. And I, I've come to realize in the months and years post coma why it happened, because I would have been much more tempted to dismiss the whole thing if this hadn't happened. But it was amnesia. I had no memory of Eben Alexander's life uh, and Earth, humanity, this universe, empty slate. And that was uh, basically something that necessitate was necessary necessary for me to have the full bore experience that I had. If I'd had it a little more kind of classically defined, uh, I had full memory of events, you know, that would have been one thing, but I would have been much more tempted to dismiss it all as wishful thinking. And that's why I had to go this extra deep level with the amnesia. Plus it showed me a tremendous amount about how memories are not even stored in the brain due to the dynamics of my losing all that memory in the coma experience, but then regaining all of my prior life memories in the two months after my coma. So in this very amnesic setting, it started, as you say, a very kind of uh, kind of foreboding world. I called it the earthworm's eye view. It was primitive course, subterranean, uh, had no body awareness. It was like being in dirty jello, uh, pounding monotonous sounds, things like that. But the good news is it didn't last forever. I was rescued by a slowly spinning white light it came packaged with a perfect musical melody. Um, 
And the, the remembering the musical notes of that melody was crucial in later phases of the journey because I could remember the musical notes and that would bring back up these light portals that allowed me to traverse between various spiritual levels. But in that first passage, I came up out of that ugly uh, uh, earthworm eye view into a brilliant ultra real gateway valley. This is where we would reunite with souls of departed loved ones, which is one of the most common uh, features of NDEs across all cultures going back thousands of years. Our loved ones are there. Their souls are available to escort us over. Uh, that's there in primitive cultures. It's there in, in many modern cultures and NDE accounts. It's extremely common. And um, so in this uh, beautiful gateway valley, also know this was where we would go through our life review. Life review is uh, where your life flashes before your eyes. It's a course correction for souls to actually help them make amends for any of the kind of evil or badness they've handed out in this lifetime to make amends and show more kindness, love, and compassion, which are really the rules of that spiritual realm. And this is then how we, with our soul groups, plan next incarnations. I'm, uh, I'm quite convinced of this notion of soul contracts. I would say it's mainly the hardships in life that we pick out and the various roles that uh, souls will play. And we change roles. And, you know, you might have a father uh, or a parent-child relationship that in another uh, incarnation, it flips and, and parent becomes a child and child becomes parent, etc. So there are many ways that it can be reshuffled. But the life review is critical, uh, and especially when you study the scientific uh, compilation of life reviews, you find that something like three quarters of them involve uh, people experiencing all the events of their life from the perspective of everyone involved. So your life review is not just your little life review. It involves your interactions with others, but in a way that you feel what your action to them felt like. So that if you've handed out a lot of pain and suffering to others, your life review is not necessarily going to be very pleasant because you have to be on the receiving end of all that. In fact, I think that this is where our notions of hell came from. People who have tough life reviews where there was a lot of pain they were handing out and when they had to receive it, uh, obviously, major course correction to realize, uh, you know, that that was not the ideal way to move their soul forward. Uh, but it's really about this bigger picture of connection and getting along and taking care of each other. And the life for you is ultimately the golden rule. Treat others as you would like to be treated, written into the very fabric of the, fabric of the universe. In this gateway uh, valley, I was a speck of awareness on a butterfly wing. I never had any body awareness during any part of this seven-day coma journey. Uh, and the best news is I wasn't alone on the butterfly wing. All the beautiful things I was witnessing, thousands of souls dancing down below in this meadow, uh, the beautiful waterfalls and the sparkling pools and uh, the lush plant life, no sign of any death or decay. This world was a world of ideals. It was absolutely beautiful beyond description. Uh, and I was sharing it with this guardian angel. She was there on the butterfly wing with me. I'll never forget that look, her sparkling blue eyes, high forehead, high cheekbones, broad smile, soft brown hair flaming, framing her lovely face. She never said a word to me. She never had to. But I think her message to me delivered telepathically with that incredible power of emotional engagement and identity uh, her message to me is I put into words later, because when it came to me from her, it was pure conceptual flow. But I wrote those words out weeks later as I was uh, had come out of coma. And her message was, you are deeply loved and cherished forever. You have nothing to fear. You are uh, richly cared for. And I cannot tell you how affirming and reassuring and joyful that message was in that moment. In many ways, it kind of brought back to me that I was in my spiritual home, you know, people, I use all these words and people think, well, that sounds a little foreign. And yet so many people identified with the words I used in the book Proof of Heaven uh, because they would contact me. In fact, that's a lot of the source material for the book Map of Heaven, where people who reached out to me because my words to them brought back memories of their own deep, profound, similar journey. Uh, and that's what gets you when you start studying NDEs is all these similarities. At any rate, what happened in my journey uh, was the angelic choirs that were emanating chants and anthems, hymns that would thunder through my awareness in that beautiful gateway valley where I was simply observing everything as a speck on a butterfly wing. Uh, all of that music from above 
uh, became yet another musical portal. And I remember seeing all of what I could sense as the material realm, a very dense realm of, of low frequency condensing down. And then all of that spiritual realm, the, the gateway valley. And remember, this is a realm where you're completely outside of earth time, birth, death, everything in between simultaneously presented to you. It's one of the reasons why these journeys are so difficult to put into words. They're ineffable. Uh, our language is great for describing a trip to Disney World, but not so much these incredibly rich, profound, ultra-real spiritual journeys. Uh, and believe me, it's beyond anything that a materialist would ever expect if they think brain creates consciousness. And as your brain is overtaken with meningitis, your consciousness dims down to zero. What happens is you actually have an, an expansion of consciousness and awareness to a much greater realization. Now, mine was in the setting of the amnesia for Evan Alexander's life, but it still allowed for tremendous lessons, including in the next level, because when those angelic choirs, all of this world that I was witnessing, the spiritual realm collapsing down into this complex oversphere, my awareness was expanding until I got to what I call the core infinite inky blackness, but filled to overflowing with the divine love of that infinitely loving God force. Important to point out that more than 90% of near-death experiences going back thousands of years across all cultures, many of whom were previously atheist or agnostic, more than 90% of them come back believing in a loving, personal, uh, kind of prayer-accessible God force. Now, I'm not saying this has to be a Christian God at all. Uh, in fact, I would tell you that if you're trying to limit it to a word of God, God, Allah, Brahman, Vishnu, Jehovah, Yahweh, Great Spirit, all the many terms people have used to try and corral and define and own that uh, kind of spirit at the core, it's, it's not uh, to be owned by us at all. It is, in fact, the co-creative force at the core of all of emerging reality. But what I learned is uh, no religion has it just right. Uh, the more any religion focuses on unconditional love, on universal caring without exclusion of any beings whatsoever, all-inclusive love, compassion, kindness, mercy, acceptance, that religion is on proper line. But uh, any of the religions that are fomenting war and conflict and violence have clearly gone completely off the rails, away from the original message of the prophets, and it's time to return to the simplistic uh, purity of that beauty of the message from near-death experiences. Uh, so in my journey in the core realm, uh, even though I couldn't have an Eben Alexander life review, I could witness life reviews and reincarnation in very broad form. It was in two visions, uh, the flying fish vision, which I'll leave out for now in interest of time, but go to the more advanced vision I had on a later passage through the core. Uh, that's what I call the Indra's net vision. And that showed beautifully the interwoven threads of our lives. Uh, it was almost like breathing, like the inhale is being in, in body and physical form. The exhale is between lives, life review, reunited with uh, souls of departed loved ones and planning next incarnations, coming back in, program forgetting. A very important feature of all this is all the knowledge that we gain on these journeys. All that knowledge is not necessarily available to our little ego mind living in these bodies. And that's why even though children can have these memories of past lives and they can be decades ago uh, or even longer, um, you know, our, uh, uh, it turns out that, um, that the uh, uh, that that whole experience of recall is uh, layered over, so that by age six or seven, most children who had those past life memories no longer remember them, and this includes children who have been heavily written about. Books have been written about some of these cases, like Soul Survivor, which I highly recommend. And uh, it turns out, though, that uh, uh, none of us are, are supposedly meant to remember everything as we advance. Now, I would say more advanced souls who have, who have been here more times uh, and have great experience moving towards that oneness with the divine, uh, they might be uh, a little more readily able to uh, you know, keep the information of higher soul in living this life. But for whatever reason, in the modern state of human development, that program for getting to give us kind of skin in the game for this life uh, is still there, still very active. Uh, at any rate, for me, uh, in this IndrasNet vision, reincarnation, past lives, all of that came to life uh, in this beautiful vision of how we're all here 
to help transform and evolve uh, consciousness, the mind of the universe itself is in the process of evolution. And that's nothing more than individual sentient beings coming to this deeper understanding of their own relationship with the mind of the universe uh, and with uh, all of our fellow minds that are living these lives and uh, sharing these journeys in this process of learning and teaching, growth, transformation, evolution. It's not just a blind mechanistic wheel of reincarnation you're trying to get off of, which would be, say, some interpretations of Buddhism, but this is actually more of a grace-filled uh, transformation, a positive affirmation of soul growth and the evolution of consciousness itself. Now, in my journey, getting back to it, I would tumble back to that earthworm eye view. I went through all these levels multiple times, many lessons. We don't have time to go into all that. But the upshot is there came a time when I could no longer just remember the musical notes of the melody to usher up this light portal that took me into the brilliant gateway valley in the core. Uh, to say I was sad would be an understatement. I also knew by that point I could trust that the universe would take care of me. And at that point, I'm now kind of stuck back down in that earthworm eye view, but now surrounded by thousands of beings going off into the distance, heads bowed, murmuring energy coming from them, some holding candles. And that energy was very... Uh, uh, energizing. It was incredible to me. It brought me back to the same state of kind of love and connection that I uh, achieved earlier in those higher spiritual levels. Now I was getting it at this lowest level. And the last thing I saw, and what I call that, by the way, was the power of prayer, because I recognized that these prayers were basically drawing me in this direction. But the last thing in my whole journey, this was the six faces I saw that bubbled up out of the buck would say a few words that I didn't understand, amnesia still active. Um, and then they disappear. But I remember those faces as sharply today, just like most of that experience. I remember sharply today as the whole thing just happened yesterday morning. And yet this is more than 15 years in the past. And it was those six faces that really got my attention. And they turned out to be very important. They were veridical time anchors. They were basically family, friends, and one of my physicians who were there the last 24 to 48 hours of my coma. So it showed me basically that the vast majority of the coma journey, the spiritual journey, had to happen uh, before uh, day night four or night five. The reasons for that, I explain all the timing in Proof of Heaven and in the third book, Living in a Mindful Universe. Um, but it was really the last face I saw that was most important. It was a 10-year-old boy and pleading with me, Daddy, you're going to be okay. Daddy, you're going to be okay. Now, I didn't understand the words. Turns out that was my son Bond. I didn't know, I didn't recognize him in that moment because my coma, amnesia, et cetera, very active. Uh, but he had just overheard the uh, doctors, held a family conference. They discussed that I was on day seven of medications, day seven on my ventilator, but showing no real signs of improvement. Uh, that in fact, um, I'd gone from a 10% chance of survival down to 2%, but with no chance of recovery. Uh, and they were recommending just letting me go. And that's why Bond came running down the hallway into the room, pulled open my eyelids that were taped shut as I was lying there on my ventilator. One eye over there, one eye over there, neither pupil working. Anybody in medicine knows that's a horrible picture. And I promise you, I was not seeing him with my eyes, with my physical eyes or hearing him with my ears, but his pleading with me was getting through to very deep levels in that spiritual realm. And that's what helped me to come back to this world. But this whole journey, because of my amnesia, I thought this can continue, it can cease, doesn't matter. Now, all of a sudden, everything mattered because there was another soul out there that needed me. And it was my love for him, even though I had no idea what our relationship actually was, but that deep love for him and the sense of his pleading tones, that's what drew me back to this world. And it was a few hours later that I was fighting the ventilator. They pulled out the breathing tube and my youngest sister, Phyllis, told me it was almost comical Shortly after that, when she got there, uh, I was sitting on the bed like this little Buddha, and I was, and they spent the whole week worrying that I was going to die, pretty certain I was going to die. And now here I was sitting on the bed, looking each and every one in the eye and saying, don't worry, all is well. Don't worry, all is well. And uh, that's pretty much been the truth for me ever since I came back. And it's something that I like to share in this world because of the tremendous lessons, especially of the scientific growth, the nature of consciousness, the brain-mind connection, it's basically all leading us towards a scientific proof of the reality of a God force, of the soul, uh, and of our kind of connected souls, all being here to improve uh, 
this life in cosmic consciousness. That is so, so beautiful, this story. So profound. I love hearing it in your animated words. And one of the things that I was a little surprised about that I've never heard before, so this was a new takeaway for me, is when you were sharing about the, it's not just a life review, you actually have the ability to become all these other people who are in your life that you perhaps did something to that was not very beneficial for them. And that is really, really powerful. And it also reminds me, you know, one of the things I teach because I do shamanic healing for people. And I teach about this ancient, beautiful practice of shamanism because it's got a lot of profound lessons for what's happening today on earth and how humanity can write the direction we're going in. Uh, and one of them is to do the shadow work, work on the dark energy, transmute it so that you can live in the light, have no regrets. And of course, shadow work, what does that mean? It means you have to stop saying, I blame, you did. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, you have to become everything and everyone to see the different points of view, to start to understand what you brought to the party and what created that situation. Once you're there, any person who is a good person, generally, when they see what they've been doing, will have remorse and then we'll want to make amends and make things different going forward. We'll give up that behavior. So shadow work is very important. And now that I hear you say this, Eben, I'm thinking, boy, <laughs> everybody should amp up that shadow work now so you can do the work here instead of having to transcend the veil and let your soul go to the other side and see all these things you did to other people and to other circumstances. Um, that is very powerful and a really important reason to start owning all of our creations. That's a very, very good point, Debbie. I'm so glad you brought it up. And uh, really, that's kind of the essence of it, because if you look at life reviews uh, through a big lens, and here I'm talking about a paper Bruce Grayson wrote in the fall of 2021 in the Journal of Near-Death Studies, where he reviewed 700 life reviews. Uh, in several thousand NDEs, but he had 700 life reviews to work with. And interestingly enough, about a third of them said that they relived their entire life, you know, and so you think of a life review happening, you can say during a 10 minute cardiac arrest, um, and it just shows you the timeless nature of that realm where people can re relive their entire uh, life. Uh, and he also said that something like 45% of people said it was a reliving of events, not just remembering, but some people remember details uh, due to this intense remembering. I saw an account not long ago where somebody said that he drowned when he was a young child and in his um, NDE, he could count the number of mosquitoes in the air over the lake where he went under. I mean, that is detailed recall and it's not just memory, uh, you're reliving it. Uh, and of course, the other really important ones of three quarters of that group of people said that the life review was from the perspective of all involved. You could almost say that in that realm, it, the realm is one of love, of that uh, God force of love that's so obvious and brilliant and light everywhere. And that's why it's so telling if parts of your life review, you did things that don't look so good in that light. Uh, but again, remember that you know, the positive stuff is obviously involved in a life review. This is all about your soul in general. Um, and that's why it makes good sense as my partner, Karen Newell, who's also the co-author of Living in a Mindful Universe, our third book, as she often reminds me, do a daily review. Why save all that baggage up? And um, I think that makes perfect sense. You know, I meditate an hour to a day. I use sacred acoustics. And anybody wants to learn more about a very powerful um, form of binaural beat brainwave entrainment for deep meditative uh, uh, journeying, I go to sacredacoustics.com to learn more. I've been doing that for more than 11 years now. 
an hour to a day, very powerful way uh, to get into deep transcendental states. I've used it to return to my own NDE, but anyone has the power to start doing this, this, this kind of work. And ultimately, our soul work is done here living these lives. So it's not as if you meditate and meditate and meditate, and that's how you gain enlightenment. But the meditation provides a key. It allows you to escape the fear and anxiety of the ego mind. Uh, and the ego is not your friend in this kind of spiritual journey. And most of us are kind of driven by our ego mind. And the ego mind, of course, is also right at the heart of addictions, uh, not only uh, to substance and alcohol, but to addiction to sex, to, to addiction to love, addiction to work, addiction to exercise. I mean, these things can uh, wreck our lives. But when we have a more balanced kind of higher soul uh, in charge, it's not necessarily just following the demands of the ego. That's when we can start to serve this purpose where meditation allows us to gain the sense of peace and connection with the universe at large. But it's how we live our lives, how we think about ourselves and act with ourselves and act with others. Uh, that's all, all that it's all about. Uh, is that kind of growth and meditation can help us. Centering prayer for me is what I do in meditation. To me, there's no difference between them. Centering prayer is another way of silencing the ego mind, that little voice in our head, the annoying roommate, as Michael Singer calls it in his voice, the untethered soul, uh, and to come to acknowledge that we're much more than that little ego mind. And that's what meditation can do. And I would tell you that someone who follows a a regular program of meditation is going to, come, going to come to all of these kind of deep understandings on their own through personal experience. And that is really kind of the holy grail of all this is uh, having your own personal experience, but you don't have to have an NDE. That's my point. You can come to uh, much more fully acknowledge the reality of your eternal soul and its uh, good and loving and healing nature uh, through meditation and, and centering prayer. Mm -hmm. I'm appreciating how articulate you are with all of this. And there are times, Eben, when you're talking, I'm literally getting goosebumps. I know that after you came back, it was a bit of a journey. It was not simple. Uh, so you had medically just been through so much. And so it took you a bit. And then once you would come out and were able to articulate your story and so forth. You were then interviewed on tons of platforms, including the Dr. Oz show and Oprah Winfrey and ABC, uh, Good Morning America, Fox TV. And this is what I'm getting to Larry King. So you were interviewed by Larry King about six years ago, and he very plainly stated to you in that interview he said, I don't believe in spirituality. I don't believe where I'm going to go anywhere after I die. However, years after he interviewed you, Larry passed on. Do you ever wish that you could check in with Larry King and find out, okay, now that you've gone on the other side, how is your experience? How are your views on this now? Have you considered that? Well, I've done that in meditation, and uh, I cannot tell you that I've gotten an absolute high five, hell yeah, this is the best thing since sliced bread from Larry King, yeah. uh, but I've sensed that he's doing very well, mm. um, and uh, I, I would love to hear from his family if they've had any kind of communications or senses about that, because you're right, he, he had uh, Karen and me as guests, uh, and uh, I, you know, to me, he was making real progress. He was actually coming to a deeper understanding than he was claiming. Um, and one can only hope that by the time he passed from this world, uh, he was fully engaged in that and, and very comforted by it. No question. The, the very nice thing about all this is, you know, when you leave this world, you're given the proof and you know it. So it no longer really matters to your earthly soul because you get it that this is the way it really works. I mean, to me, the real travesty would be to spend your whole life as a hardcore atheist materialist and then lying there on your deathbed when your beloved, you know, departed mother and father and, you know, or siblings or even children who have departed the physical plane come up to welcome you. And you realize that they're really here. Their souls are still alive and available, that you wasted your whole damn life as this material is completely off target about what the goals of life are. We're here to, to treat each other. 
with kindness, compassion, and mercy. Take care of each other. Take care of the least, the last, and the lost. And believe me, there are a lot of those around today. We're really here to be compassionate and kind and merciful to all of our fellow beings. That's it. In our modern uh, materialist uh, kind of besotted culture um, is, uh, you know, with the narcissism and the egocentrism, uh, a lot of it is kind of lost. And, and that is such a tragic thing for those uh, people, because following that bleak and paltry fiction of materialism is not uh, a pathway towards happiness. It really is a bleak uh, and it's a false story. So why not pay attention to where the science is going? As I said earlier, uh, your listeners can go to BigelowInstitute.org to learn a tremendous amount more, 29 essays there that will prove beyond any reasonable doubt in scientific terms, the reality, not only of the afterlife, but of reincarnation. And now post NDE, let's talk about changes. Um, I even want to know if your food has changed. Uh, definitely your spirituality has changed. And it looks like your point of view and this ability to just flow, everything's going to be okay. How has Holly fared post NDE? What kind of changes or how changed is she? Your children, in what ways are they forever more changed? Well, I would say my both my sons have uh, gained a tremendous amount from this, and they both have contributed tremendously to my understanding of the experience. Mm -hmm. So I'm very grateful to both uh, Bond. Bond was really, you know, the force that led me back to this world. And Evan the fourth, my older son, he was majoring in neuroscience in college at the time. And uh, uh, he knew every time you revisit a memory, you change it. And so when he got home two days after I got out of the hospital and he drove overnight because he heard I was staying up all night because I couldn't sleep. I was so energized by this incredible experience. And he got there at about six o'clock in the morning, gave me a big hug. And he told me later, it was like a light shining within me that I was far more present than I'd ever been before. But I remember telling him because my doctors had told me the dying brain plays all kinds of tricks when I tried to share my, my spiritual experience with them. And so they told me that, that, and, you know, we believe our doctors and my neuroscience knowledge hadn't come back yet. I was just barely out of the hospital. I had not yet begun to review my medical records in detail, which was a big shocker. Uh, because they were completely incongruent with having a brain that could go through any kind of rich, of uh, phenomenal experience. Uh, so anyway, my uh, Evan the Fourth, he told me, write everything down before you read anybody else's near-death experience, which is not what I wanted to hear. I wanted to read everything I could. I was busy writing already, but he was right. So I wrote about 20,000 words over six weeks. And only then did I dive into that NDE literature. And that's why I was shocked when I started finding all these similarities and kind of character and kind of the transformational change and uh, kind of the element of uh, being elevated up and out of space and time and the speeding up a thought process and all these in incredible conditions that occur in an NDE. And I could sense those same things occurring in other people too, based on uh, their reports, verbal reports and written reports, et cetera. Uh, but it's really all about uh, coming to a deeper understanding. The scientific world is absolutely shifting dramatically. We're in the middle of a paradigm shift uh, that really hasn't occurred since Copernicus, uh, you know, centuries ago, uh, who recognized that the earth was not the center of the universe as people had thought, but that the sun was, we, the heliocentric model of Copernicus. Well, this is similarly a revolutionary uh, kind of fundamentally changing, changing uh, game of understanding of the nature of reality, which puts consciousness as primary and actually says a tremendous amount about our free will and our ability to manifest the world of our dreams, the world of our ideals. And that's what this line of inquiry in this conversation is really all about, is homo sapiens truly coming into wisdom. That's what the word sapiens means, is wise. Well, when I look at this world, maybe I can see some traces of wisdom from the action of science in the 20th century in medicine, in communication, in transportation, things like that. But I also see the ugly underbelly of all that technological progress, especially in the form of climate change from greed, unbridled greed of the energy industries selling coal and, and oil, when it we I can show you a paper from 1912 where the, a scientist was making the point that if we keep burning uh, carbon fuels, the planet's going to heat up. It's automatic. It's simple chemistry and physics. And uh, 
he was right. The planet's heating up. I know when I was in my training in the 70s and 80s and, and 90s, we thought that uh, climate change was a big problem for our children and grandchildren. Well, it turns out now it's gotten so bad and it worsens so much each year that we no longer can keep punting down the street until and, and say, we don't have to do anything about this. It's time to take responsibility for climate change and bring sustainable energy, start demanding less in the way of resources, resources from a finite earth and start being better stewards of this planet. Uh, but that's a lot of what this awakening is all about is becoming intelligent, paying attention to the science and the details of this and stop this before we fall over the edge of the cliff into the abyss. Yeah. You mentioned Homo sapiens. Can you talk about during your NDE, did you begin to have an awareness of galaxies, other galaxies, the cosmos, extraterrestrial beings, and possibly other lifetimes that you have had as an extraterrestrial being? Well, I did. And uh, I mentioned, it's briefly mentioned in Proof of Heaven, I talk about the advanced civilizations uh, that I could sense. In fact, to me, the analogy was that these civilizations were so far beyond us, it was kind of the same that we are beyond earthworms. So just this incredibly vast sense of kind of awareness of possibilities. Uh, and of course, in that space, you're kind of at a point where you can get it all. But bringing that back to a human level of understanding is challenging tremendously challenging. And that's one of the reasons why I use meditation is to keep returning and trying to put together bigger and bigger pieces of that puzzle. But uh, to me, it was obvious uh, that there are civilizations all throughout the cosmos. In fact, I think they're involved in trying to help us from destroying ourselves. I know I had several conversations with Edgar Mitchell, the Apollo 14 astronaut. I stayed in his home in Florida on several visits there back in 2013, 2014. Uh, and he was quite optimistic about how uh, the ETs were there to help us. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, I'm not going to put words in his mouth, but my interpretation of our conversation uh, and certainly of my experience and of my meditative experience uh, along these topics is that I believe that there are, uh, you know, other very advanced intelligences uh, that are involved here in trying to help us not blow ourselves up. I mean, the, the height of insanity is that we even have such a proliferation of proliferation of nuclear weapons that we could destroy this planet many times over. And everybody knows a nuclear war could never be won. There is no winner. So why would you ever start one? Well, in that sense, why do we even have all these weapons lying around? And I know that, uh, you know, uh, 10 and 15 years ago, we made actual good efforts with uh, Russia to get rid of nuclear weapons. And we decrease the number of nuclear arms on earth. But what we need to do is as human citizens, we all need to demand of our leaders everywhere, every country on earth, demand that they de, uh, you know, denuclearize, get rid of nuclear weapons. And I think there are practical ways to do this. But the sheer madness that you know we can have uh, Putin, who in my mind is very belligerently you know, taking us back 70 years, copied Hitler's playbook and trying to conquer a neighbor. That is abominable behavior in the 21st century. And we cannot allow any despot authoritarian figure to get to such a, a position where they could, you know, threaten the world with nuclear weapons. And this is important for all of us. The U.S. has the second greatest number of nuclear weapons. We need to be leading the charge to get rid of nuclear weapons and to pacify this world, bring harmony to this world. And this is where the sanity of near-death experiences and what they teach us about the realities of, of the golden rule of treating others as you would like to be treated as being right there in the fabric of the universe through these life reviews. We need to all be paying attention to these deeper truths and try to grow into the wisdom that Homo sapiens truly implies. 100%. I am, thank you so much for saying it exactly as you did. I am completely aligned with you. Nuclear armament is the only time that extraterrestrials have ever gotten involved with humanity. They know we have free will. They're hoping for us. They're waiting for us. I have only myself ever had benevolent experiences with UFOs and extraterrestrials. They've been very beautiful and very hopeful, but that is the only time is when they think somebody's going to launch. They have 
disarmed what was about to happen, the head of the nuclear armament. So yes, I agree with you. I believe that the benevolent ones are waiting to usher us into the galactic community. I would like that to happen in my lifetime, but I know we need to get it together here somewhat. We don't have to be perfect, but we need to make some very drastic changes. And did you ever in your travels, whether they've been since you've come back or while you were in this near-death experience, did any information about artificial intelligence intelligence ever come up? Was there ever an understanding of how that impacts our understanding of consciousness or what these beings are? Well, I think right now, you know, we've had uh, various forms of artificial intelligence around for a while. Certainly in medicine, I know back in the 70s and 80s, we had what were called expert systems, uh, which were just very large databases that were well constructed so that you could actually make sense of it. Now, you got to remember that this modern AI revolution with these large language models uh, is simply using a given um, you know, person's speech and looking at statistical maps of what words uh, most naturally follow other words and sequences of words in that person's usage. So they're kind of duplicating a lot of what we've said with our words over time, but you got to be very careful that you don't have garbage in, garbage out. Uh, so in other words, the input data is extremely important. And still don't begin to think that there is an actual conscious awareness that's involved with this apparent AI. My own feeling is that I don't think any digital computer will ever be consciously self-aware. I think it's impossible uh, based on general principles. That's not to say that a quantum computer, and we're only just beginning the very most rudimentary kindergarten steps at constructing quantum computers. And uh, this statement is more about uh, advanced quantum computing if it ever really happens. And I think it will uh, over time. But uh, the reality is uh, that potentially could enable enough of states and their kind of involvement with uh, this physical universe to be a self-aware system. So I'm not uh, diminishing that possibility. Uh, I do think that there's great reason for caution, especially because our current level of artificial intelligence is much closer to artificial stupidity than anything else. And, um, you know, I'm not trying, I'm not being condescending on that community because I think there is potential hope there for real progress, but we haven't seen it yet. And especially, for example, when Google rolled out their version of AI about a year ago, um, and it immediately, you know, went after a database and said, uh, the, you know, when asked a question about the James Webb Space Telescope, it said very proudly and confidently that the Webb Telescope had first discovered exoplanets. You know, Google stock dropped about 7% because anybody who was paying any attention knew the AI had completely screwed up and was just dead wrong. Uh, and that's a problem is AIs still have uh, quite a capacity to do what's called hallucinate. Yes. And that is to start following a chain of a kind of logic based on these uh, statistical assessments of large language models that lead it into no, no, never land, you know, to uh, complete nonsense that everybody gets is complete nonsense. And it's called hallucinating. And it's still a very prominent problem in those systems. Um, and I think especially there are plenty of ways where humans could pull the trigger too quickly on letting AI kind of run the, run the world. And this is especially frightening when, for example, you look at militaries that are talking about automating AI systems uh, into killing machines so that the killer is out there, you know, using AI to decide what to kill. Uh, and I don't think we're anywhere close to a point where we should be having that kind of trust uh, in AI. So I think a very a cautious approach uh, and this involves regulations. Mm -hmm. I know some people in the tech industry don't like regulations, but if you misbehave and wreck our world, we're going to be mighty angry with you. So don't do that. And that means that we also need regulations to keep, you know, cowboys from getting too far off in the distance here doing things that potentially are very dangerous to us in our world. 100%. Yeah. 
I find that for the simplistic things, AI right now, it's pretty phenomenal and creates a great ease. But I has, have also had this hallucinogen experience you're talking about where I've asked it to cull information and it's come back with things that are really off the beaten track. They're just not anything that I could use. So I like that artificial, artificial intelligence versus artificial stupidity. Right. And yes, to all the regulations, I often have Matthew James Bailey on the show. He's a phenom. And this is one of his expertise is AI. And he talks about how there are many in place, but very important for us to get many more rules and regulations in place so it is ethical and we're living in harmony in accordance with one another. I want to segue over to the fact that I will actually get to see you in person. I'm very excited. Coming up February 7th through the 10th, 2025 is the 23rd annual Los Angeles Conscious Life Expo. I think this may be your first time there, speaking there. And I'm going to put a link in our show notes in the description so people who would like to register and get tickets can get them there in the show notes. But tell us, what are you talking about in February at LA Conscious Life Expo? Well, I'm very excited about uh, getting out to this Conscious Life Expo. And uh, basically, I'm going to be uh, kind of telling the story of, of what I went through uh, in terms of my NDE. I won't go into too much detail because there are many other sources for the details of that story, but especially about its relevance to the main uh, brain-mind connection uh, to their relationship, to the nature of our perception of reality. But most importantly, I'll be directing my talk towards how science supports the reality of your eternal soul. So in other words, this is going to be a, a, a big foray into the modern science. I work with scientific groups around the world. If you want to learn more, you can go to scientificandmedical.net or galileocommission.org. Both of those uh, sites uh, I'm on the scientific advisory board for. And you'll see that there's a lot of progress being made as science advances. But what I'll be doing is taking all that to the next level for the personal individual seeker for the soul out there uh, wanting to know more about their kind of role and kind of uh, how they interact with other souls, with the mind of the universe, how we had shared purpose and meaning, uh, how meditation centering prayer uh, can help to kind of fill out our picture of higher soul and who we are in living these lives. And um, I will cover a lot of the material, for example, that's in our third book, Living in a Mindful Universe, especially about uh, all of the proof uh, for the reality of primordial consciousness and how we're all interconnected. The brain is serving mainly as a filter, a reducing valve or a transceiver for this primordial mind. And this is all something that I'll be explaining in much more uh, kind of full detail, including the scientific and spiritual kind of intersection and how they support each other. Um, and also the personal tools for growth so that individuals can take this information and apply it in their daily life, starting right now with some very powerful tools, in the form of differential frequency brainwave entrainment uh, and all the stuff that, as I said earlier, you can find out about at sacredacoustics.com. But I'll be talking a lot more about my personal use of those techniques uh, when I'm at the Conscious Life Expo in LA, uh, February 7th, 8th. I think my talk is on that Saturday. I don't know yeah. exactly and when folks go to the link, they've got the entire agenda set up, all the speakers. So you can click, look, you can even do a, a you can do a search, Dr. Eben, E-B-E-N, Alexander, and you'll see exactly when he's on. They do a very, very good job. There's 10,000 people at least who go through those doors for people who are worried about the sense of overwhelm. I can promise you don't be. I am about as sensitive energetically as they get. And it actually has this beautiful ebb and flow all the time. So there isn't overwhelm, but there's incredible speakers like Dr. Alexander with, uh, it's life-changing information. That is my favorite event. And I speak, I moderate, I go to many events, but LA Conscious Life Expo, it's kind of it, the best of the best. So we'd love to see you there. And all these people, Dr. Alexander, they are your people. These are very spiritual, on the path, 
know the message, ready for more message, folks. And so they're going to just love you. And my final question is, this is Dare to Dream. What do you next dare to dream? What are your future dreams or goals? My dream is really one of uh, achieving the world peace that we're talking about. And I think it is achievable. I think it's achievable within our lifetimes that we can actually get a far more uh, positive, harmonious, uh, prosperous world for all involved uh, that doesn't leave any soul be behind. And uh, this is really where I see the world headed. It's one of the reasons why I put so much time and effort into these um, basically thousands of talks and presentations I give about my experience is trying to help this world get on board with a very peaceful and harmonizing message of oneness and unity and of shared uh, purpose, meaning, life, and love. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Much appreciated. Beautiful message. Well, Debbie, thanks so much for having me on. It's great being with you, and I look forward to seeing you out in L.A. in February. Yes, yes. And folks who want to learn more, go to his website, E-B-E-N, ebenalexander.com. And I end today's show with this quote from Josiane Antoinette, a near-death experiencer. From the light we have come, and to the light we all shall return. Subscribe to this number one transformation conversation, Dare to Dream with Debbie Dashinger. If you love what you're hearing, subscribe, like, leave a comment. I read them all. And as you do that, it puts this information in front of others who are hungry to hear it and learn it as well. Next week on the show, I am having back to the show, Marie Diamond. I just adore her. She is a famous feng shui master. She was originally seen in the movie, The Secret. And now Marie has, my goodness, I don't know if she has the time to write all these books, but she actually just wrote a brand new book on home vision boarding. And she also has a brand new TV show on Apple TV. So be sure to join us again next week. Remember, don't just dare to dream, dare to create all your dreams into your reality. And as Dr. Alexander shared with us so beautifully, whatever you might think you'd see in your life review, I'm saying, handle it now, take care of it now. Your life and also your contribution to humanity and to this beautiful planet that we live on. Thanks for joining us.